I'm Barbara Welsh, a member of your Board of Trustees. Welcome to the Mainline Unitarian Church. Thank you for joining us on this chilly morning. Those of you who are here in the building with us, as well as our friends who are on YouTube. And if you're here visiting as a visitor, you've only been here a few times, be sure when you come to coffee hour after the service on the other side of the atrium, take a visitor's cup so we can be sure to greet you and get to know you. We have a wonderful worship team this morning. We have our wonderful senior minister, Reverend John Morehouse, and Dawn Stars, Sarah Borschelt, our director of Lifespan Faith Development. She'll lead us in the time for all ages. Caroline Bright is our ministerial intern, and we're welcoming Pat Jordan this morning for the first time as a worship associate. Tina Adams is on the piano, and helping her is going to be Wolfgang Jaeger, who's going to be playing for our hymns. And I want to thank our tech team, who make the sound and audio of the service possible. So who are we? At Mainline Unitarian Church, MLUC, we're a liberal, inclusive, religious community coming together to support each other as we seek spiritual growth, connection, and more fulfilled lives. I've been a member here for almost 50 years as I'm making my spiritual journey, and I'm so grateful I found this congregation. Busy time of year, so I have several important announcements. You're going to learn more later about our auctioneer, Ron Rose's accident. But I want you to know how you can help him heal. And he's promising he'll be back for the auction, which is going to be on November 11th, our Harvest Moon auction. This is how you can help Ron heal. You can sign up to offer something in the auction. The auction is more than anything, it's about community. We do things for each other, we share our houses with each other, we get to know other members that we don't know. And the more items we have in the auction, the more community we build. So there's a, a table in the atrium, you can talk to them. There's so many little things you can do, big things you can do, to share with our congregants. So please stop by the table to get ideas and to honor Ron and Joanne's many years as our auctioneers, let's make this the best auction we've ever had. Second, nominating committee. It's getting to be that time of year again. They're available starting today to answer questions about the positions that you'll vote on in next spring's annual meeting. So serving in one of these positions is a great way for you to give back to the church and learn more about the church. So please stop by their table in the atrium after the service to fill out a form to nominate someone who would be a good candidate for leadership in the coming year. In two weeks, on Sunday, October 22nd, Elizabeth Bartolet, she's the program manager for Family Promise, have you heard about that? Used to be Interfaith Hospitality Network. It's a way that we help families who are suffering from homelessness. They stay in our building five times a year and Elizabeth will be here in two weeks to tell you more about how you can help. A lot of us have done it for years and we wouldn't miss helping out when the Family Promise is in our building. And then lastly, there'll be two classes, 201 and 301, that comprise the pathway to membership. They'll be held October 12 and 19 from 6 to 8 p.m. A light dinner will be served. See Madeline Seiko after the service. So now, if you have not silenced your devices, please do that. And we will read our mission statement together. We transform lives through love, service, and our welcoming faith. This light 
we kindle is set in the lamp of our history. We inherit this free faith from the brave and gentle, fierce and outspoken hearts and minds that have come before us. Let us be worthy inheritors of this faith, and through our good works, pass it boldly to a new generation. Our call to worship today is in two parts. The first part is a land acknowledgement, an acknowledgement of Monday's Indigenous Peoples Day. The land where we are is part of Lenape Hoking, the ancestral homelands of the Lenape peoples. My direct ancestors came to this very land here in Philadelphia and were welcomed by the Lenape people with kindness and generosity only to have those initial years of peace destroyed by greed through broken treaties, forced migrations, and fraudulent agreements like the walking purchase of 1737. Today, we honor the wisdom of the original caretakers of this land and share our gratitude for the gifts of the Lenape peoples in the past and in the present. We strive to understand our place within the legacy of colonialism. We honor and respect the Lenape ancestors as well as the vibrant community that continues today. And because of that, let us be a people of not forgetting by Reverend Karen Johnson. As we gather this morning, let us be a people of not forgetting. Let us practice holding collective memories that might otherwise slip into that enormous void that sucks at and corrodes any future we hold dear. Let us practice honoring truth-telling up from the past that must come fully into the now, lest we falter and fail, lest the whole remain in pieces. Let not our need for comfort or simplicity for easy forgiveness or false pardon, smother the heartbreak that still needs healing. Let us practice resilience with reckoning. Let us marry memory and promise. Let us dance in the tension we find there. Let us rest in the integrity we cultivate there. 
Let us be partners with the possibility that emerges there. It is good we gather. And now I invite you to rise and body your spirit for our opening hymn, Wolfgang will lead us in number 183, Winds Be Still. Long ago, it was said a fox will be loosened on the earth. Also, it was said that four crows will come. The first crow flew the way of harmony with the Creator. The second crow tried to clean the world, but he became sick and died. The third crow saw his dead brother and he hid. The fourth crow flew the way of harmony again with the Creator. Caretakers. They will live together on the earth.
Each month, we select an offering outreach partner, a charitable organization that we feel is worthy to receive half this weekly collection to help them with their mission. This month, our offering outreach is Safe Harbor of Chester County. Safe Harbor of Chester County is a nonprofit charitable organization whose mission is to provide housing, food, and access to support services in a structured environment for homeless single men and homeless single women in Chester County. At Safe Harbor, our community is our village. It takes many hands and hearts to serve individuals facing homelessness. In Chester County, the number of homeless men, women, and children is increasing and the amount of affordable housing is decreasing. As we face the crescendo of these issues, Safe Harbor services are even more vital and essential to the community. Safe Harbor's goal reaches beyond just feeding the homeless and providing housing. We seek to understand each individual's unique needs and have a positive and long-lasting community impact on poverty and homelessness in Chester County. Would you bring up the information that was on the screen? It is my first time, you know. <laughs> I wanted to uh, finish what I had to say. If you would like to make a donation online, follow the instructions that you see on the screen behind me. Thank you. Uh, if you are in the sanctuary and forgot your wallet and you have your phone, you can scan or uh, scan the QR code that is on the order of service and you can make a cashless donation. And the offering has now been gratefully received. <laughs> Gone more than I re realized. <laughs> It's now time for Candles of Community, the joys and concerns of our congregation. We would like to start with uh, Jean Ramsbottom, who has this to say. He wishes to offer a prayer 
for the end to the violence on both sides along with the oppression in the Holy Land. Molly, who, uh, whose name is, is what we will use here, her husband has been diagnosed with Lewy body dementia and she needs community support in caring for him. Ellen Youngdahl um, has a new grandson. Is it Joe? Ellen, are you coming forward? Gio. Gio Ling Lombardi Kung from her daughter Rebecca. And he is a beautiful and healthy baby. For Ellen, we hold you in our hearts. It is such a pleasure to light a candle of joy today to celebrate the addition of David Brown, violinist par excellence, as our new MLUC music director, with the added delight of having his mom, Jody Brown, whose pianistic skills constantly amaze, uh, as a continuing part of our musical family. David's wife, Caitlin, will participate whenever the schedule from her own church gig allows. So, for David, Jody, and Caitlin, we hold you in our hearts. Olive Ledley asks for your concern for her and her husband, who returned home on Wednesday after four weeks of rehab for a fall. For Olive and her husband, we hold you in our hearts. We received the following from Joanne and Ron Rose. Ron took a nasty fall on Friday down a flight of dark stairs in the middle of the night. In addition to cuts and bruises, he cracked 10 ribs. He returned from the hospital on Tuesday, but obviously in pain. He has asked for no phone calls, uh, but uh, neither does he uh, really want contacts or visits. Joanne and her daughters are providing everything he needs. <laughs> if you want to do anything to lift his spirits, he asks that you donate items, services, and or events for the auction. He and Joanne plan to conduct the auction November 11th. So for Ron, Joanne, and their daughters, we hold you in our hearts. Dana and Jay Wiley, have sent in this concern. Uh, Jay's brother-in-law and their brother-in-law, Larry Barnes, suffered a significant brain bleed last Saturday, September 30th. He is now under the care of the University of Vermont Medical Center. For Jay, Dana, Larry, Jay's sister Suzanne, and their son Luke, we hold you in our hearts. Kit Burns tells us that her sister, Dee Owens, is in Bryn Mawr Hospital with pneumonia. Dee is slowly improving and now would welcome visitors, calls, or cards. If you plan to visit, please call ahead. For anyone who does not know Dee, she is a valued member of our congregation. For Dee, in our hearts, and now for all those joys and concerns that are being held, some too deep for words. We light a candle. Reflective reading. <coughs> now, the following reflective reading is taken in part from the text of then Senator Barack Obama's speech on racism pre presented in Philadelphia and printed in the New York Times in March of 2008. 
we the people, in order to form a more perfect union. These simple words launched America's improbable experiment in democracy. Farmers and scholars, statesmen and patriots who had traveled across the ocean to escape tyranny and persecution finally made their real declaration of independence at a Philadelphia convention that lasted through the spring of 1787. The document they produced was eventually signed, but ultimately unfinished. It was stained by this nation's original sin of slavery, a question that divided the colonies and brought the convention to a stalemate until the founders chose to allow the slave trade to continue for at least 20 more years and to leave any final resolution to future generations. Of course, the answer to the slavery question was already embedded in our Constitution, a Constitution that had at its very core the ideal of equal citizenship under the law, a Constitution that promised the people liberty and justice and a union that could and should be perfected over time. And yet, words on parchment would not be enough to deliver slaves from bondage or provide men and women of every color and creed their full rights and obligations as citizens of the United States. What would be needed were Americans in successive generations who were willing to do their part through protests and struggle, on the streets and in the courts, through a civil war and civil disobedience, and always at great risk to narrow that gap between the promise of our ideals and the reality of their time toward a better future for our children and our children's children. Well, thank you, Pat, and uh, don't worry about it. My first sermon, which I think was in Elkhart, Indiana, 30 three, four years ago, was an unmitigated disaster. <laughs> I got the readings wrong, I mispronounced names. I did worse than the priest on four weddings and a funeral when he blessed the couple and said, in the Father, Son, and the Holy Goat. Ghost. You did great, don't worry about it. It's all part of learning. And as I like to say, and you'll hear it a lot from me, folks, it's not about perfection, it's about participation. I invite you into a time of meditation and prayer. Close your eyes if that is comfortable for you and place your feet on the ground. If it's possible to straighten your back up and put your shoulders back as if you're breathing in a little courage in this time. To unfurl your brow. To rest in the moment of your breath. Let us breathe in together and breathe out. This breath, this oxygen which we share with every living being on this planet, this breath has been breathed, breathed in by enslavers and the enslaved, by great musicians, by those who sing songs in order to find their way in a world of trouble. This breath we breathe in together has been breathed by those who would be despots and fanatics and those who would do good and bring comfort 
parents around the world who have held children, those who are in need, and those who can give help. As we rest into a silence between the bells, let us breathe in this breath and remember that we have shared this same oxygen with all living beings in this collective moment. Let us find peace in that. Last Sunday, I shared with you the message of what I hoped was some possibilities about the future that would bring us the strength we need to face these days ahead. I asked you a question to ponder during the week. Does anybody remember what the question was? Wow. <laughs> you know, they say, and they say if a preacher can make it from Sunday to Monday, they're doing a great job. The question was, <laughs> what is yours to do? The question is, what is yours to do? So much has happened in the course of a week, right? This war has erupted again in the Middle East. And our hearts, of course, go out to those in Palestine and Israel as they, force, they face once again these difficult times. But we've also heard from the Nobel Peace Prize Committee that Narges Mohammadi, the Iranian activist who is fighting for the rights of women in Iran, who is imprisoned in Iran, has won this year's Nobel Peace Prize. But I want you to focus here first on what you think is yours still to do. What a wide open question. Is it taking out the garbage? Is it remembering to pay the bills, or is it something a little more closer to home? And you can answer that either individually or you could answer it collectively. You could say to yourselves, what is ours to do as a congregation? So what I want you to do now is turn to your neighbor, and if you don't know who they are, introduce yourself, at least say good morning, and answer the question, what is yours to do? Let's go and do that for a second here.
You know, I love the way you do this. Um, I love the way you do this. I, I think my work here is already done. You've you said it all. But let's hear just a few uh, from, the, from the folks here. What is yours still to do? Anybody? Oh, yes, in the back. Yes. Collective activities. Collection. Okay. Anybody else? Well, you hold that close to your hearts, folks, because there's a lot to do. Go ahead. What ahead? Youth involvement. Youth involvement. Absolutely. We are in the middle of searching for a new youth coordinator. Did you know that? Pass it on. Yes. Listening to youth. Listening to listening to youth. Yes. Yeah, they are. Yeah, listening to youth. And I've said this before, I think, from, the, from here and elsewhere, that I think the youth actually will lead the way. If you look back to any of the great movements that have happened across the world, the great, the great changes that have happened across the world are almost always first led by the youth. Almost always. Yes, I thought I saw another hand over here. Yes, over here. Um, I would like to figure out what my grandchildren need from Want to figure out what your grandchildren need from you. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Jean, did you want to say something? Uh, well, social justice is always at the top of my list. Good. Well, you're in luck, because that's what the sermon is about today. So, <laughs> Thank you all for that. When Francis and I lived in California, uh, we, uh, we, we moved into what we thought was going to be a diverse neighborhood, although we were already paying three times what we had sold our house for in Frederick, Maryland uh, for a simple bungalow with no heat, no air conditioning. Not that you needed it in Southern California because you open the windows and the breeze comes in and you close the windows when it's a little chilly and that was just wonderful. But where we lived, where we lived was San Pedro and it's pronounced Pedro there. Uh, and San Pedro is, a, is the harbor to Los Angeles. It's the Los Angeles port. Uh, and the way they did that was Los Angeles is 20 miles sort of inland from that part of the coastline and they just, they annexed the uh, corridor of one of the freeways down to it and just swallowed up the port town and made it part of Los Angeles. But San Pedro was this wonderfully ethnically diverse place because it was a port town. It had Slavs and Croats and Russians and of course it has Hispanics and Italians and Cretes. Crete. When I would go to the YMCA, I could hear four different languages, some of which I couldn't recognize, which is a little unsettling if you're standing there naked and trying to figure out what to do. <laughs> but the ports of Los Angeles and the twin port of Long Beach, they're, they, they're connected to each other, is where 70% of our freight and oil in this country comes through. It was a beautiful place, this bungalow we had, it was up on a hill. It was a place where the entire bay could be seen sometimes on a clear day, even downtown Los Angeles. It's where I learned Tai Chi over a beautiful bluff over the, over the Pacific Ocean. And there was this grittiness to it that I loved. This sort of understanding that we were all in this together. And you didn't need to go anywhere special for the fireworks display because you just sat out on your deck and watched all the illegal fireworks going off over the <laughs> entire port. It was quite, quite wonderful. But the congregation that I served was in Palos Verdes. And Palos Verdes is a peninsula that sits up, sits into the ocean. And it's a big hill or a series of hills. And it's 95% white. And most of the remaining 5% Asian American. And almost everyone on the hill was upper class, and many of the neighborhoods were gated. And I served a congregation that largely did not come from the hill. They came from the beach cities down off the hill. But I had to reconcile what I thought was this paradox in my existence, serving a wealthy congregation, or at least in a wealthy part of the country, Pacific Unitarian Church while living in this other part of the, of the area which was more diverse, or at least so I thought. But as I went deeper into living there, I realized, as I have everywhere I've gone, that there's always more to the story. Now, Palos Verdes, was, it was easy to see the classism and the racism that was embedded in there. 
Many of the neighborhoods, the small cities that are on the hill, had what was known as a sundown clause. It was in their, it was in their restricted covenants, part of their housing codes, that people of color had to be out of that city by sundown. And even when the Supreme Court made it illegal to do that, other restrictive covenants, particularly in zoning codes, replaced that. And I would imagine that that's true here as well. Codes are used as a way to enforce the status quo, to enforce the culture of the predominant class, which in our country is white. But even as I was looking at San Pedro and I was looking at the story there, I realized that something was not quite right. There were these little, little neighborhoods in San Pedro, little Croatia, little Italy, and little Russia, and, and they, were, they were wonderful little neighborhoods. They were very ethnically homogenous. We lived in little Italy, which was a great place to be when, when Italy came down to the World Cup semifinals, although we didn't sleep for two days. <laughs> But we learned later, I learned later, that the zoning laws in San Pedro were also restricted. That they were written in such a way that it made it, it, made it undesirable for brown people, particularly Latinos, Latinas, and the next people to be able to live there. And where did they go? They went to Wilmington which is a port city downwind. Everything in California is about the wind off the ocean. And they were downwind of the refineries. Intentional ghettos for all intents and purposes. Wilmington and then Compton and South Central LA, which you've all heard about in the news, created in a way to keep brown people out, brown and black people out. The cancer rate in Wilmington the cancer rate in Wilmington was four times the national average. I've just returned from a week-long transitional ministry training in Montgomery, Alabama. I've never been to Alabama before. And that took some getting over the culture shock. But I went there in part because the organizers from the UUA wanted us to come to grips with the enslavement history that has made us all wealthy in this country. And within five or six blocks, it was all there. Rosa Parks, the Montgomery bus boycott, all of the work that had happened over the years to begin to put aside Jim Crow. But of course, there are other institutions of racism, particularly mass incarceration, which are very much still in play. We would not be here, friends, if it were not for centuries of enslaved free labor. We would not be here, friends, if it hadn't been for the fact that we had taken the land from the native peoples who lived here. It was a very powerful week. The days were long, and they were filled with images that were not easy to reconcile. I stood on the spot where the slave market had been where, where, where individuals who had been taken away from their, from their homeland were auctioned as property. But it wasn't when, until I went to the memorial on top of the hill that was built to show the power and the horror of lynching that I broke down. I realized in each of, these, each of these boxes that hang down, which are really coffins, has a county in the south, and laser engraved in the steel are the names of those who died. And as I said in my post this week in, in, on Facebook, I said, and lest you think you are all exempt from it here in Pennsylvania, there was one last block that showed all the northern states where lynchings had occurred. I broke down because I knew that my ancestors, good, hardworking New England Unitarians, though they were, made some of their wealth from the textiles that were produced from cotton that enslaved people grew. It was a bitter fruit. A bitter fruit to taste and a reminder of the work that we have to do as a religion, the work we have to do as a country, and the work we have to do as a congregation. Repair, though, 
my friends, can only begin when we acknowledge what is wrong. It's been my lived paradox to serve congregations which are located in wealthy areas, Palos Verdes, California, recently Westport, Connecticut, and of course, now here on the main line, MLUC. And there's similar histories in all of this. And this isn't about putting any blame or shame on you, but it is making us understand, I hope, that we bear a particular responsibility to do what we can because of where we live. These similar histories, of course, don't assume, because I think many people do, that everyone who lives or, or comes to this congregation is themselves quite wealthy. That's not necessarily true. It's been my experience that there are actually many more middle-income people in the congregations that I've served in these, place, in these places, and some who even live closer to the poverty line. You would be surprised. And all of us have the experience of being kept out of the equivalent of the social register. I've learned all about the social register. This is a thing, right? People used to keep the social register under their phone in the hallway. And if you weren't in the social register, they didn't pick up your call. I had no idea. But now I'm learning. And I'm learning that these towns that are here have a history a history of keeping things a certain way. And I know that some of you here are here because you want a place that does not hold that up. And I've never met the priest at St. David's Church, but I can imagine that their congregation and our congregation are very different, no? So friends, let us remember at times that all of us can suffer from oppression or the assumption of wealth itself becomes an oppression. Questions like where you're going this summer might assume that you have some kind of summer house. Or where are your kids going to college might assume that you're going to college. Or even as one person told me last week, they're invited to lunch with a group of people and, and they've, they've saved their money, they have cash in their pocket, they have water to drink, they have a, 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 a medium priced meal, and, and then when the bill comes and everybody else has been drinking and having a lot of fun, then someone says, well, let's just split the bill, right? That's happened to me. I'm like, oh boy. It's not what you planned for. You weren't planning on splitting the bill. And that assumes, again, this level of understanding about wealth. So part of my mission among you will be, of course, first and foremost, to bring us together to bring that sense of healing and connection that we so long for. But I will also prod you a bit. I wouldn't be doing my job if I wasn't comforting the afflicted, but also afflicting the comfortable. Do you hear me? Now, if we're going to do this work together, if we're going to journey, whether this is an individual journey of, of hope and renewal and the need to heal, or whether it's more collective in our place as an unapologetically progressive congregation. We're going to need to enter where the woods are darkest. In the Arthurian myth, the quest for the Holy Grail begins where each knight must enter at the darkest part of the wood. That darkness could be your own fears of your own time and your own life. And that's not a journey that I expect you to share with everyone, although we have resources if you are in such a place. But I also think of those who were dispossessed of this land and those who have reaped from the benefits of enslaved labor. And I'm preaching this to you in part because tomorrow is Indigenous Peoples Day, a reminder that the colonizers such as Columbus came to this land and committed genocide on the native peoples here. This land was not discovered, friends. It was taken. This is a history that's rarely been told. And I want to recognize, first and foremost, that this history is here and that we need to deal with this in some way. And I don't want us dealing from a place of shame and guilt. I want us dealing from a place of understanding and the idea of repentance and healing. 
My purpose here is not political, although it may sound that way. My purpose here is more spiritual, because I think only by retelling our history with honesty and courage can we open up to what has held us back. Whether that's our individual journey or the journey of ourselves as a congregation, And I know that true collective revelation only comes when we are facing what has kept us in prison. Can you hear me? That too often we hold things in our heart that we think somehow we're going to be able to just skate by it. But you know what? You don't get to skip that. I think it was Emerson that said, the only way to the other side of our troubles is through them. And each of us has some guilt in our life that we've dealt with. I told you, I think, when I arrived here about the collective guilt, the guilt I carried in my own heart from what I thought was my fault and my brother almost drowning when he was three and I was 10, and I had lost track of where he was because I was playing with my friends, and he'd fallen into the swimming pool, and my mother ran out of the house recognizing that something was wrong and saved his life, and I thought it was all my fault. And it took years of therapy and the love of my beloved to finally find a way through that to the other side. That understanding of collective, that understanding of personal guilt can also be collective. So I'm going to ask those who are interested here to dig a little deeper into the history of where we are actually sitting right now. To find out what's the story, what's the local story about how all this came to be. I think this could be very healing for us. Now sometimes I've thought, well, you know, these beautiful buildings that I've had the privilege to be the minister in are some really choice real estate, right? And more than once in my young and rather more stupid days, I've suggested, well, what if we sold it? and use that money to help the poor. Yeah, that's a non-starter, so don't worry about it. It's not gonna happen. (laughs) I did try that once in California. They all came in, sat over my dead body, and I think think they meant it. The point is this. We're not asking us to give it all up. I'm only asking us to look inward either personally or collectively, and face the history that is there honestly. I'm really pleased that the UUA's common read, did you know they do a common read every year, a book that they ask the entire denomination to read, did you know that? The common read this year is on repentance and repair, making amends in an unapologetic world. And it's by Rabbi Dania Ruttenberg, and it's based on the wisdom of the 13th century Rabbi Mohammedes. The book speaks eloquently about how we can both earn and receive forgiveness. I'm halfway through it, and I think it's one of the most powerful books I've ever read. I would like us to think about repair. So I'm inviting us to do a common read this year, and sometime after the new year, I'd like to hold a series of workshops where we actually talk about this and relate it to our own lives and to the life of the congregation that we so love. Because the journey of transformation, friends, the journey of transformation begins personally, but it does not end there. It doesn't even end within the walls of this beautiful building. It ends when we have taken into account all those who have suffered. Repair is important because we want to be the people who deal honestly with issues of enslavement and genocide. We want to be the people who understand that democracy means something more than just pretty words written on a page. As Susan Frederick Gray, the past president of the UUA, wrote some time ago, just a few months ago, she wrote, democracy in the United States has always been compromised. At the nation's very founding, participation in government was almost always limited to white male landowners. Wealth was was created from those who were excluded, land seized from indigenous peoples who were forcibly assimilated or removed or exterminated, she wrote. And labor exploited from enslaved Africans, indentured servants, immigrants, prisoners, the working poor, women and children. And in compounding this corruption was this existential threat to the global climate crisis, which our current government is not going to solve for us. The impact of all of this falls most heavily on low-income communities. 
Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. echoing Unitarian minister Reverend Theodore Parker said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Who of you have heard that line? Hmm? He said that when he was at the Lincoln Memorial, he said it on many occasions, but we can no longer wait for it to bend on its own. Can you hear me? We have to push the bend. We have to be the people who have come, no matter where we are in our life and circumstance, to actually push it along. As people of faith, we are committed to the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and society at large. It's one of our principles. As a means to an end, democracy organizes decision-making among diverse people. It preserves stability while balancing competing interests. But democracy is not merely a means, it can be an end in itself. The ethical, ideal, moral, spiritual way that we have of being connected to one another. It's why we embrace democracy. So the voices that are not being heard can be heard. Democracy is not just a set of rules and systems, it's a culture and commitment to change. It's a culture and commitment to recognizing that individuals within a group have the right to say what is on their minds, and more importantly, we have the collective right to change the world. It's not just about your voice, it's about your actions. And from the founding of our nation, the real history that we don't often tell does need to be told. We need to understand our part in it and then do something about it. This truth-telling will lead us to liberation. Because liberation is not just for those who are imprisoned in, a, in an outward sense, but all of us. All of us are dealing with something that is holding us back. All of us have some peace, some soul that is being held in bondage, some story that needs to be freed. As the black and queer activist Jarabi Jones said, one thing I've learned is that the core of white privilege, there's an entitlement to amnesia and ignorance. To forget that America was founded on stolen land, stolen labor, and that we live in a society structured by this history. If we are not willing to face that, we are unable to embrace a new world. Here it is, my beloveds, my friends, my new congregation. We are here to tell history in a new way. Not a way ridden with guilt, but in a way that is honest, in a way that then begins to build for us a new beginning. That this congregation here can be known as the congregation that understood the truth that needed to be told, dealt with it, and then did something about it. We start with ourselves, but we, we have to spread out collectively to this congregation, to this community, to the world. This is part of the mission of transforming lives. This may be the harder part of that work. When we face our past collectively, we will heal from our past personally. Take my word on this. I've seen it happen thousands of times. And I believe it will lead us to a promised land. I don't know what the promised land looks like. But I have an understanding that the promised land includes dealing with injustice and in so doing freeing our own souls. As Abraham Heschel reminded me, few are guilty, but all are responsible. Few are guilty, but all are responsible. I feel responsible. I feel that there's something that needs to be done to admit the history, to bear witness, and to help myself and the world heal, and to help you do that too. So I close with these words from Utah Phillips who said, the long memory is the most radical idea in our country. It is the loss of the long memory which deprives our people of the connective flow of thoughts and events, which will clarify our ability, vision, not just of where we're going, but where we want to go. So may it be, and amen. Our closing hymn is number 318, We Would Be One. I invite you to rise in body or spirit.
Beloved, the work is just beginning, and yet you have been doing it for decades. I would say collectively for many decades, but my friends, the work we have still to do is what makes this service only a beginning. And every time I close the service and say, now the service truly begins, understand I mean this from this place. This place of understanding personally and collectively that we have the power to change the world. You are loved, and you are blessed, and you are part of a great experiment. Let us extinguish this flame, but not the flame in our heart. And let us begin here the new beginning that we have always been promised. For now the service truly begins. Please remain seated for the postlude. <laughs> 